Good morning and welcome. The greatest evidence that Jesus rose from the dead wasn't an empty tomb or the grave clothes folded neatly where Jesus' body once lay. The greatest evidence was the eyewitness accounts. These testimonies aren't from a once-off sighting. In a 40-day period, over 500 witnesses encountered Jesus. They walked with him, talked with him, ate with him, touched him. They weren't gullible people looking for something to believe in. For the most part, these were skeptics, defeated people who had lost their hope, whose hope had been dashed and they now found it hard to believe that the man they saw die on that cross was alive. Our Gospel reader, reading this morning shows us one of these encounters. Cleopas and his companion are telling the other disciples how Jesus appeared to them on the road to Emmaus, when Jesus again shows up out of nowhere, interrupting their conversation. Peace be with you, he says. It starts with a terrified group hesitant to speak to this man who now stands before them. But Jesus changes the atmosphere in that room when he says, Look at my hands and my feet. The scars we have tell a story. I remember how excited my eldest son was at the age of 11 when he needed four stitches in his head. He would have a scar, how exciting! This was a really cool thing at 11. And then the disappointment when his hair grew over and the scar faded. It couldn't even be seen. Well, Jesus' scars also tell a story. The scars on his hands and feet change this group of frightened recluses into champions of faith. Jesus isn't ashamed of those scars. He wears them as evidence of his love for us, his sacrifice, his victory on our behalf. Have you ever wondered why Jesus kept the scars? Because he, I suppose he didn't have to. Well, I want us to look at what those scars tell us. His scars tell us, I am the same Jesus. The most obvious reason is the issue of his identity. Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. It was infallible proof that this was in fact the same Lord they'd walked with and talked with, the same Lord they'd seen nailed to a cross. The scar on his side was distinct. The others had their legs broken, but this scar would let them know that this is in fact Jesus. His scars also declare, I have won. Like a war veteran that bears the scars of battle, Jesus bears the scars of our freedom. These wounds aren't disfigurement, but badges of honor, demonstrating the price that Jesus was willing to pay for our victory. They demonstrate Jesus' victory over sin and death because he paid the full price for our pardon. His scars also declare, I keep my promises. Not even death could stop Jesus from keeping his promise. How do we know that Jesus will come back? Well, because his scars prove that no matter how long it's been or how dark it looks, Jesus always keeps his promises. He is the embodiment of God's promises to us. Scripture tells us that Jesus is now interceding on our behalf at the right hand of the Father. And I can almost picture as we pray, Jesus turning to the Father and showing him his hands. His wounds still plead and overcome on our behalf, even today. His scars also declare that the empty tomb and the cross are inseparable. It's too easy to try and separate these two events in our thinking. They are three days apart and the sentiment of the two is drastically different. But the tomb without the cross is meaningless. And the cross without the tomb is incomplete. With his scars, Jesus reminded the disciples that the same Jesus who rose from that tomb was the same Jesus that had suffered and died on that cross. Even the joys and the celebration of his resurrection were always reminded of the cross. And so what should this truth do in us? Well, we're told that in John 8, that when you know the truth, the truth will set you free. And I'm not talking here about knowledge, but truth. Knowledge is educational, but truth is transformational. As these facts became truth to the disciples, we can witness the transformation that took place in them. And there are a number of changes that took place. The, tr the truth turns fear into peace. Jesus asks them, why are you troubled? Before we can ever have peace of mind, we have to have peace with God. And unless we embrace the truth that Jesus is risen, we will never really embrace peace for our lives. In verse 45, 35, we're told that while they were still talking about this, Jesus stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. And we use that phrase so often, but have we ever really thought about what it really means? The Hebrew word for peace is shalom, which means fullness and wholeness. 
The peace is in knowing that everything is in those nail-scarred hands. So why should I worry? We can struggle on our own and it will crush us. Or we can hand our lives over to the one who has overcome the world. The truth also melts doubts and makes way for faith. The scars are undeniable proof that Jesus who had died was now alive. Critics will never have enough evidence to believe. But the sincere doubter can find the reality of a Jesus who isn't afraid to challenge our doubts. Over 500 people testified to the fact that they saw and touched the man with the scars still in his hands and feet and sides. Remember the encounter that Thomas had with him? A doubter until Jesus showed him the scars and invited him to touch them. The wonderful thing about truth is that it also brings joy into our lives. It started with a hesitant joy in verse 41, but ended in verse 40, 52 with worshipping and great joy. The disciples were at first surprised by joy. How could they feel joy after everything that they had seen and experienced? Can you imagine the emotional turmoil over this time period? How could the heaviness of grief and despair lift so quickly? We often and mistakenly think that joy is escaping the problems of the world. But joy gives us the ability to face them with strength. We don't need to settle for substitutes for joy, substitutes that rely on our circumstances. We can get the real thing from our resurrected Lord. How often do we pray to God to change our situation, to change our circumstances, when actually he's wanting to change our character? He's wanting to change our character into one that can experience joy through him. He wants us to be people who know the joy of our Lord in every situation. The truth also opens our understanding. It wasn't until they'd embraced the fact that Jesus had risen that Jesus could open their understanding about all that had taken place and would still come. Understanding God's word and God's plan hinges on embracing what took place on Calvary and that empty tomb. It doesn't matter how much we know about the Bible or how well read we are, how much we've studied, until we embrace the cross and that empty tomb, until we understand the truth of what that means for us and how that impacts our hearts, we've missed the point. The wonderful thing about truth, the truth of Jesus, is that it unleashes hope for tomorrow. Jesus placed the disciples back on track with their future. They were given instructions to go to Jerusalem and await the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And we know that this was merely the beginning. And God also has plans for us, a mission for us. How could they so confidently strike out in the future when just a little while back they'd felt so threatened? Well, they could do it because Jesus had revealed that our hope is endless. Because that nail scarred Saviour came back, they weren't afraid of even the prospect of death. I came across a comic strip some time back with two women sitting on a small hill and one is reading the Bible and she says, Oh my goodness, it says here that Jesus descended into hell. And the other is shocked and says, you're kidding. The other one replies, oh no, not to stay. He just dropped in to cancel our reservations. And that's the wonderful truth that we have. Lastly, the truth demands a choice. What will we do with that empty tomb? What will we do with the scars in his hands? There were some eyewitnesses that chose not to believe. The Roman guards, for example. For them, belief wasn't a matter of proof or a matter of believing their own eyes. It was a matter of convenience. It wasn't the popular thing to do. It would cost them too much. But look at what they lost. Christ longs and desires to open our minds to understand the scriptures, to understand all that has been written and spoken and revealed about him in whatever form that happens and has happened. That's what Jesus did for the disciples, and it's what he does for us. This is not an academic or intellectual understanding. That the disciples are witnesses does not mean that they now have all the answers. It means they now have the life Jesus wants to give them. They're witnesses based not on what they know, but on who they are, how they live, and their relationship with the risen Christ. And so just as the first disciples were commissioned to bring the good news of salvation to all the nations, so we are called to be witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus to all. Do we witness to the joy of the gospel to those around us? Do we live on this side of Easter? Or are we stuck like those who refuse to believe in the resurrection and what it meant, stuck in denial and skepticism? By living on this side of Easter, we can become a new creation by being born again. 
We have the chance to start over in Christ, to live through the power of Christ. We walk in the light and knowledge of God and no longer fear death or the grave. We have eternal life, a new everlasting eternal body. Jesus' resurrection, his appearance to his disciples, when he showed them his scars, changed the lives of the disciples and then the world. I pray that each of us may truly see the scars of Christ and be just transformed by the truth of our risen Lord. Jesus says to us, you are witnesses of these things. May we tell it, live it, believe it. The resurrected life is yours. You are witnesses. Amen.